Good morning, everybody. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming to join us this morning for our Centre for Aging Better uh, Breakfast event. Uh, my name's Anna Dixon. I'm the Chief Executive of the Centre for Aging Better. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we're a charity. We're about enabling everyone to have a good later life, and we work with a range of partners to bring about changes in society based on evidence. So I'm really delighted uh, that we were holding this breakfast event on the topic of how can business meet the ageing grand challenge. As you'll know, the government's industrial strategy identified ageing as one of four grand challenges and called on business to work in partnership with others to develop products and services to meet the needs of a growing consumer, uh, older consumer market. And uh, they identified a number of areas, including health and care, homes and neighbourhoods, finance and the economy, and work and purpose, where innovation is needed. So that's the sort of broad context for our uh, debate today. And before I introduce uh, speakers and panellists, just a couple of uh, practical points. So first of all, we are live streaming, so welcome to those uh, who are joining us remotely on our YouTube channel. That uh, will also be available afterwards if you would like to share uh, the discussion today. Uh, we'd really like to encourage you to tweet uh, during the event to share this debate uh, more broadly. And I think the hashtag uh, was up there a moment ago, um, uh, Aging uh, uh, Better Events and the Aging uh, Grand Challenge. Um, so, I think uh, we, as I said, we were uh, recording the event, so as you ask questions, just be aware of that and uh, await for the microphone to come to you. Um, so, in terms of uh, the format for today, we're going to uh, hear from a moment from our keynote speaker. I'm very delighted to welcome uh, Carolyn Dynage, who is Minister of State <coughs> for Care. Uh, before uh, being appointed to her current position, Caroline uh, held positions at both the Department for Work and Pensions and the Department for Education. Um, once Caroline has uh, spoken, she's going to be able to be with us till 9.45. Uh, we'll have a moment for Q&A, and I'll invite the panel uh, first to post questions and comments to uh, Caroline uh, before opening up to wider questions from you. Uh, once uh, the Minister has left, we'll have a bit more time to come back to our other panellists to hear a little bit more from them, and I'll just briefly introduce them to you now. So, um, first of all, we'll hear from Lance Batchelor, who's Group Chief Executive Officer at Saga, where he's been since 2014. Uh, prior to Saga, um, uh, Lance has held senior marketing positions at a range of companies, including Procter & Gamble, Amazon, Vodafone, Tesco Mobile, and uh, Domino's Pizza Group. And Lance will be giving us a bit of a perspective about who are these older uh, consumers that we talk about? Uh, secondly, uh, Sarah Weir, who's Chief Executive of the Design Council. Uh, before uh, joining the Design Council, again, Sarah's had a, a very interesting career, held senior positions across a range of arts and <coughs> culture organisations, including the Roundhouse. Uh, she was a key part of the Olympic Delivery Authority, where she was Head of Arts and Culture Strategy. Um, she's uh, been Executive Director at the Arts Council England and also at the Almeida Theatre <coughs> amongst other things. Um, and uh, she had an OBE for Services to the Arts. So it's wonderful, Sarah, thank you for joining us. And she'll be talking a little bit more about how uh, design and inclusive design is needed to meet uh, the needs of our ageing population. And our third panellist that I'd like to welcome is Hugh Edwards, who is Public Affairs Director at UK Active. I think I hope I'm going to describe UK Active Right as an umbrella body uh, that uh, uh, represents UK leisure and fitness industry broadly, but um, I'm sure Hugh will tell us more about <coughs> UK Active. And prior to um, joining uh, UK Active, uh, Hugh has worked uh, in a number of sports and also uh, British tennis, but also actually with Sarah, I think, on the Olympics 2012 um, before that. So um, that is our uh, lineup for this morning, and uh, without further ado, I would like to invite the Minister to address us. Thank you. <coughs> well, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to see you all uh, here today. I'm really delighted to be here just to have the, uh, the chance to kind of kick it all off with outlining a few um, points about our latest thinking on the Asian Society Grand Challenge. 
Uh, everybody in this room clearly is well aware of the rapidly aging, diversifying and growing population. But the first thing I want to get out there is this is something that we have to celebrate. Too often in my role, I hear people say, we're all living longer. <laughs> aging, it's such a challenge. <laughs> and, you, and I keep thinking to myself, hold on, we need to stop. We need to say, we're all living younger, yay. It's a good thing. You know, people aren't dying because that's the alternative. So, the, you know, the first thing that we, we need to say is that this is something to be celebrated and to be embraced and to be taken forward with joy, I think. Um, but actually, the Prime Minister, as you will may, may be aware, has this mission to ensure that those extra years are quality years and that people can enjoy an extra five years of healthy, independent living by 2035, while also tackling inequality. So it's not just about the years in our life, it's about the life in our years. I'm sure it's a phrase you've heard a million times before. The thinking behind this is that we need to boost the quality of life across the whole life course, making sure that people look forward to the extra years being really good ones, and making sure that we make the fastest progress for those who currently are experiencing the worst outcome. So to achieve this, they, there need to be many interventions across many agencies, from health and care, to housing and work, and at a national level and at a local level. But today I wanted to focus on the role that industry can play in achieving this mission. And with this in mind, I was very pleased to read the Centre for Aging Better Transforming Later Life Strategy and see how many of our aims and ambitions are shared and I know that there is strong support for this strategy from across business and charity and it fills me with confidence that the government, industry, civil society can all work together on this, delivering better outcomes for the population while delivering economic growth. It's a win-win situation. By 2050 we expect the world will have 2 billion people over the age of 60. Put that another way, that's 2 billion potential customers business and that ladies and gentlemen is a lot of spending power it has also been estimated that if we were to view that silver economy as a sovereign nation it would represent the third largest economy in the world behind only the US and China the questions are how do we unlock that potential and of course how do we ensure that the UK leads the way in this these are not frail, vulnerable, elderly people. These are experienced consumers with free time, with discerning taste, and with excellent credit scores. <laughs> Businesses are missing a trick if they are not capitalizing on this incredible discerning marketplace. Firstly, I, need to, I believe we need to consider societal attitudes towards Aging. Of course, when we think about aging, we have to consider the public policy uh, challenges, but too often these problems cloud the debate and we concentrate only on the negative stories. And I believe that only fuels the public's view that getting old is something to be afraid of. Uh, and there rem remains really deep-rooted stereotypes around the aging and stigma of growing old that persists. And I've delved deeper around some of these issues around aging and I've been shocked to find out that across industry, the diverse needs of older people just aren't recognized. For example, we spoke to one retailer and they told us that they have 12 consumer segments. I don't know if I'm describing this right. Their customer base is, di is divided into 12 segments under the age of 65 and one <laughs> over the age of 65. Think about the madness of that. My parents <coughs> are past retirement age. I'm not going to say how old they are because this is being live streamed and my mother will literally kill me. But they are both past retirement age and yet both working, both still incredibly vibrant, both you know, massively contributing to the society and community around them, hugely contributing to me because they look after one of my kids three days a week. And, um, and they are in very different even from my, um, my father-in-law who's an 87-year-old retired vicar, still very mobile, still very with it, but it's a, a very different generation. Thinking about putting them just into one consumer group, to me, sounds madness. You can't 
lump people over retirement age in one little group together as older people. I mean, if you think about it now, in those terms, it just sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Um, so it's almost like I was thinking about this in the car on the way here. It's, a bit, it's also about branding and calling people older people. You know, it's like me. I'm, you know, I would rather not be described as freakishly tall, frankly. I would rather be described as Amazonian or statuesque. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's also about a branding marketing. Uh, concept as well. My view is the industry needs to break away from thinking about chronological age and start thinking about biological age, thinking about the great diversity among the population and that whatever someone's age, they will have their own aspirations, their own views, their own preferences, their own lifestyles. And if these negative attitudes persist, we not only do a massive disservice to older people, but actually we're missing a huge marketing opportunity. Now secondly, Aging is a subject which needs to be discussed in every boardroom across the country, from the large global corporates to small local enterprises. Demand patterns are changing, and whatever the nature of business, be it food or fashion or fuel, companies need to think uh, ahead about the implications of this change. We talk about the sharing economy, we talk about the gig economy, we talk about the circular economy, I don't know what that is. Why are we not talking about the longevity economy? or the mature economy, or the vintage economy. Why are we not thinking about this? We need to genuinely mainstream aging into our thinking. This is particularly well illustrated by housing. Everyone is aware of pressures on the housing market, and rightly we need to ensure people get access to a good home. But as we build these new homes, we need to think to the future. What functions the building will need to perform? as we get older. That's why I'm really pleased the government has announced its intention for a new Homes for the Future Prize, which will look at how we can combine the need for innovative construction with new technology to create more energy efficient homes that are inclusively designed and fit for generations to live well in. And I'm really pleased that this prize covers two grand challenges the ageing one and also clean growth, demonstrating how the industrial strategy is beginning to break down silos and work well across these global challenges. Alongside this, companies need to ensure that they're not in any way disadvantaging or excluding older people or those with specific needs. Work by the Financial Conduct Authority has highlighted some amazing examples of really simple and effective interventions that can be done today, such as one bank introducing effective debit and credit cards that have easily identifiable markings and different textures to help people who might be blind or partially sighted to tell people <coughs> their cards. And let's, let's, let's face it, you do not have to be old, older to struggle with this. I can't tell you the number of times I've tried to swipe myself into the Department of Health and Social Care using my uh, Oyster card because they both happen to be blue. So you know, this, is, this is about catering for a whole range of people, including those of us who are just incredibly careless. So next we need to think about a more inclusive approach to designing products, services and technology for older people. The language here is challenging. It, uh, is, is it inclusive, age friendly, age blind, for generational? But the concept is simple. It's about designing propositions so that they are attractive and appropriate to a 75-year-old as they are to a 27-year-old. And I was really pleased to hear about work being led by the National Innovation Centre for Aging into the four-generation kitchen, looking at how we can design for the needs of a, of a diverse family. And of course, there's also a pioneering work into inclusive design being led by the Helen Hammond Centre at the Royal College of Art. And these concepts are simple, and they, um, the, at the heart of the work is a very deep and serious engagement with individuals about what they want what they need, what they desire, and really understanding the market has to be key for businesses going forward. As part of this, we need to invest in technology and innovation, looking at all the new technologies from AI to robotics and how they can be harnessed to support older people. <coughs> now, some of these can be these really big ticket items. Over the last few months, I've been lucky enough to meet Paro, the robotic seal, I've met Pepper, the social care robot. My friends are beginning to think that all my new friends are, are artificially intelligent. Um, but it actually doesn't have to be big ticket items like that. I also went to Hampshire County Council and saw how they are using really sort of um, what sounds like quite basic technology to make a measurable difference. Things like a light bulb that goes on when someone gets up to go for a pee in the middle of the night. And think about the number of falls that can be avoided by just a simple little bit of technology like that. 
It doesn't have to be especially designed for older people, just adapting existing technology that we already have. They're also using Alexas and, um, and iPads to support people who uh, um, have, might have an adult, adult social care need to live independently for longer in their own homes and maintain their own lifestyle. And finally, um, alongside understanding the market, we also need businesses to understand the changing needs of their employees. We want to support employers to redesign jobs and workplaces to better use the experience of their older workers. Enabling people to stay active and to stay longer in the workplace. For the past <coughs> five years, employment rates for the over 65 have doubled. So we need to systematically look at how we can remove barriers that stop people being able to work as long as they want to. Uh, to secure our future productivity, we need to make sure that we are utilizing the talent and the skills of old people much more effectively. I see it in my own constituency where we have a huge retiring generation of um, marine and aviation engineers. And the businesses that employ them are really struggling to fill the gap that these people with their incredible wealth, experience, and talent are leaving behind. We should, if they want to stay on in the workplace, they should be encouraged to do so and shouldn't be prevented by some of the niggling bits of um, obstacles that sometimes are just so easily removed if people just take a step back and identify what it is that they might be. Personally, I would like to see also the UK become the best place in the world for an older person to start a business as well. Critically, we've got to work hard to make sure people aren't falling out of the workplace prematurely. We know that UK muscular skeletal or mental health conditions are the main reason that they leave work before the end, um, before the state pension age. And that may, um, many people are also have to leave to take on caring responsibilities. But imagine a world where technology could help to overcome these barriers, where somebody could use virtual or augmented reality to do their job without having to travel, or where a carer could be reassured that their loved one is safe through smart home technologies. But of course, technology is not the only uh, avenue we need to explore. We also need to think about how we can be much more flexible um, in our working and employment practices as well. Many companies are embracing flexible working and the benefits it brings. The right to request flexible working gives employees the right to uh, ask for working hours that better suit their outside work commitments. But we need to take that further. Flexible working shouldn't just be something people can ask for. It should be something that employees, employers really think about offering. Uh, as their default setting. And that's why I'm pleased to see the government is considering creating a duty for employers to consider whether a job can be done flexibly and to make it clear when they're advertising that job that we would consider. I did it most recently myself in a role that I was advertising for a new parliamentary assistant. I advertised it as a job where I would consider allowing someone to work flexibly and the person that got the job actually does. He's a student and he, he's a, a mature student and he takes a day or four weeks to, to, uh, to do his studies win-win situation. I've got an incredibly talented individual who is able to commit to me for four days a week and probably think about my workplace more than that, and yet he's able to pursue his other interests as well. So this needs to start with the government. I also wanted to welcome the work of the Centre for Aging Better and the business leaders who are promoting the Midlife MOT, a great idea that I'm really pleased to see uh, industry pioneering. In a world that is becoming increasingly volatile, I'd like to think that the process of ageing, both as individuals and as a society, is actually, in a funny sort of way, reassuringly predictable. <clears throat> and now our task is organising ourselves to respond. And this is equally the case for government as it is for industry. But if we act now, we can not only support our citizens, but it actually also ensures that businesses embrace the opportunities that providing products and services for a marketplace of two billion people brings with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Caroline. Lots in there, really positive uh, uh, to hear you talking both about the economic opportunity but also how we can get business working with government and civil society and uh, certainly that's what we're about at Ageing Better. 
Um, so we're going to have a little bit of time now for discussion uh, and Q and A with with you, if that's okay. Um, you talked there about the sort of the lack, I suppose, of uh, segmentation, about sort of uh, lumping uh, a lot of people over a certain age together. Um, I wonder, Lance, if you might want to pick that up in a in a comment or, or question for the minister. Uh, yes, I will. Thank you, Minister, very much. I thought it was a very um, thoughtful exposition. Uh, so at Saga, we like to believe that our reason for being is to help people enjoy their retirement. And we put lots of time and effort into lovely things like holidays and cruise ships and so on. I spend my time meeting our customers out and about, whether it's uh, on a ship or on a holiday vacation, and they're smiling, they're having a lovely time. The thing that worries me the whole time is this uh, challenge that I know you're wrestling with around um, the care <coughs> stage of life. Um, and I, I note with uh, huge pleasure that your role includes both health and care, and I think that's so right that those have now been combined into the same portfolio. Uh, I get asked all the time by customers what happens when I get older. Um, we, as a company, dabbled for a while in the care sector, uh, and what we found was that the economics just couldn't be made to work with minimum wage coming up uh, and with local authority margins so tight they couldn't afford to bring carers in and I just wondered how much progress is being made with wrestling with that mm -hmm. because for me as a kind of wor worst case it's almost an Armageddon scenario in five to ten years time where all the private operators in the care sector get squeezed out. Yeah it's a really thank you Lance it's a really good question and um, you know and I, and I First of all, I must say, I think your job sounds dreadful, travelling around the world on cruise ships. It's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> I can't leave it anywhere. Um, and it's a brilliant point because actually, uh, uh, adult social care, uh, which is you know a big part of my role, is one of the big challenges we wrestle with. And I think one of the big obstacles we have to overcome is that a lot of people don't understand what is the status quo. And I think that was brought into. Um, uh, stark um, really, really when we had the general election which talked about you know, bringing domiciliary care into, um, into means testing uh, and a lot of people didn't realise that um, health care is free in, uh, on the NHS but, um, but social care isn't and I think uh, from a lot of our polling and testing that we've done a lot of people actually really don't want to engage with that sort of um, information, because it is about em em it's, it is about embracing your own sort of future uh, mortality, I suppose. You know, and, and a lot of people really struggle to want to address that and, and plan for the future. And we do have a number of challenges. You know, as as I say, we have a um, uh, an increasing age population, but actually people are are living longer with much more complex. Uh, um, a combination of conditions that they, they may not have lived with, which is again, you know, something to be celebrated. So we've got a green paper coming out later on in this year, which will look at addressing a whole range of those issues, uh, uh, issues about how we do keep people living independently for longer, how we use things like technology and prevention to actually, you know, like I said, those light bulbs that stop someone having a fall. It's just a fall, but a fall in your own home can end up with you going to hospital. And once you're in the hospital, they may look at your provision and they may say, actually, we don't think you can live at home on your own without a care package. And then it all starts. So if we can just stave off, you know, keep people living healthily for as long as possible. So it starts with that. We obviously have to think about the long-term funding sustainability uh, and the affordability of it. You know, it doesn't seem um, fair that one in 10, uh, so four out of 10 of the population will have no long-term care costs at all but one out of 10 will face catastrophic care costs of over 100,000 pounds. It's a lottery, and we need to find some way of, of, um, of pooling the risk for that. So the long-term um, sustainability will also be covered in the, in the green paper. But actually, I think even if we had all the money in the world, there are certain aspects of adult social care that we wouldn't do the same if we were starting again with a blank piece of paper. So it's going to look at that, it's going to look at how we um, better provide housing, how we can design housing in a way that, that keeps people living in their own spaces for longer with the kind of wraparound care and support that they need, things like extra care housing. It's going to look at technology, it's going to look at a whole range of different aspects to deal with the challenges that you mentioned. That's fantastic. So obviously you mentioned about the new um, uh, Future Homes uh, Prize, um, very exciting opportunity for 
uh, ensuring that the new homes that get built um, over, over the next decade will serve the needs of the population for hopefully a, a lot longer than that. I wondered, Sarah, if um, you wanted to pick up on um, any of the uh, themes that uh, Caroline touched on around inclusive uh, design or homes. Mm -hmm. The thing that actually really struck me was when you, uh, apart from empathising with being a tall person, not, not, not always wanting that to be mentioned, but, <laughs> which is sometimes quite a pain in the neck, um, was when you were talking about age and mentioning, rather than thinking about chronological age, thinking about biological age, because that's sort of going from a fact to a feeling. Yes. And what struck me actually all the way through when you were talking is whether we can start to move to thinking about things more horizontally than vertically, and talking about government departments and businesses. So at the moment, we think about health, <coughs> we think about housing, we think about work. They're all separate departments. Yes. And clearly, I understand that yes, this is difficult to do, but joined up government, if we could start to think more across the piece rather than down, then that gets us from your biological age to you know, the fact of your age to how you feel about your age might just shift everything. Because when we're talking about designing housing, we talk about places, and we're thinking about housing linked to infrastructure and linked to jobs. Rather than just designing the house, yes. you need 78% of new housing is still more than 10 minutes away from public transport, therefore people think they need a car. But if we're moving to driverless cars or no cars, what's the point of that? We need to be thinking about these things interconnectedly. So if we redesign the thought of that, that can be almost redesigning public policy across different government departments and they all work together more closely. I think that might shift everything. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant, uh, brilliant point. Uh, the, the I suppose the reason I spoke about the biological age, I've, um, I'm very inspired by my, my uncle. We did just unfortunately lose him, but he was 94, uh, my uncle Ern, um, and he was still, immaculately smart every day in his suit, driving around <coughs> entirely with it and helping out every mm. Thursday at Age Concern. <laughs> he would say every Thursday I'm going to work and at Age Concern he was helping the old people, yeah. um, yes. many of whom were sort of 20 yes. or 30 years younger, younger than he. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and you know, so the, that biological age to me is so yeah. important and, and, and that whole sort of not working in silos is just a big challenge that I think, um, I'd never experienced it. I, I had a come from a nice normal business background. I was in business for 20 years before um, I was involved in government and politics. And, uh, and it, it, it's always been a, a bizarre fact mm. to me that government does think it. So when I came into the department, they were, we were preparing the carer strategy. Mm. And I looked at it and it was a Department of Health document. Mm. And I said, no, 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 this has to be a carer's action plan. And we need to bring in where, mm. what, what are we doing for young carers? And they said, well, this is the Department for Education. We'll get them in. Mm. You know, by the end, you know, what are we doing for carers who are working? That's business, that's babies. We'll get them in. So by the end, it was the document we produced was um, across six government departments and with 64 different initiatives, all of which that brings people together, that breaks down those silos. It's really hard to do. It's beginning to happen. So I was speaking yesterday about Plymouth, where they've got these health and wellbeing hubs where they've got health and social care and community and housing and third sector organisations. The fourth one's just opened, four have opened this year. And that, I think, is a really valuable mm -hmm. resource, you know, and it, and, it, and it requires a whole lot of brilliant people, all with the same aspiration, all working together to kind of batter down mm -hmm. the silos that divide them and make it work. But mm -hmm. it's, you know, but it's the key, it's I the think answer. It is the answer. Yeah, yeah. completely. Yeah. So Hugh, um, obviously uh, Caroline was mentioning about um, sort of social care, the need to prevent falls. Yeah. We know how important physical activity is to healthy ageing. Uh, what sparked your interest or would you like to ask? Uh, Absolutely. So I think there's a real opportunity working with the wider physical activity sector to see how we can support um, people's independence going into, into older life. Because ultimately the more independent, the healthier they are, the less pressures they're going to be on social care and NHS costs. Um, I think there's a real opportunity from my sector, the physical activity sector, to look at the product services that they're providing for people uh, in older age mm -hmm. to make sure that they're, they're reflected. I think the interesting question would be how, what are the opportunities working with government to look at some of the incentivizations? Um, we're about to undertake a piece of work around VAT. The ability to remove VAT from uh, physical activity could be quite transformative in terms of costs associated with that offer for people across the spectrum of, of, um, of income, which I think could be quite a stimulant in terms of the benefits, wider benefits to NHS and social care in 
it'd be great to explore you know where we can think about stimulants within the, the you know, maybe not the Monday and the Chancellor, but you know in terms of looking long term around what we can actually do to incentivise through taxation. Uh, through other regulatory opportunities where actually people can feel that's within their, yeah. their uh, income. Yeah, and I think that's, um, uh, that's really a valid point, you know, that keeping people active is so important. And actually, you know, it, it, it's, um, again, very cross-government, isn't mm. it? Because where, like, exactly like you say, where we build the houses, you know, I recently um, opened an extra care housing development right on the banks of the, um, the river mm. in Lambeth. And I was thinking to myself, what a brilliant place, because if someone wants to get out and go and get a pint of milk, they, they are, they're not stuck at home in a place where they have to wait for a bus or they have to get a car or they have to get someone to give them a lift. You know, it encourages activity and it may not be sort of an organized fitness class. But, you know, and the other thing I saw quite recently talking about, you know, breaking down barriers and working together, I went to Frimley, where they've got these, um, the community health team are actually co-located with the fire and rescue service. It was by accident. They just happened to have room when they were setting up this community health team. Um, and it, so they now work with the fire and rescue service. So if someone's had a little fall and you know they, they, they're, they're gonna wait for an ambulance and they're gonna, they actually phone up the fire service and the first person come and help them back up, get them, you know, 15 minutes later, they're back in their chair having a cup of tea rather than having all the stress and anxiety of going off to hospital. The, and the fire service are running these, um, Fitness, but Hugh yeah. and I were talking about yeah, these yeah. fitness classes, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. They're doing these um, safe and well checks where they go out to check people's fire alarms and push, you know, push the button and what have you. But they also look around for trip hazards and just check if someone is a bit frail. And actually, I think if it was me, if I had a nurse knocking on my door to check if I was feeling frail, I think I might think to myself, what is wrong with me? But if you've got a fireman on your door, <laughs> check, I mean, apart from the obvious, you know, <coughs> well, this is rather fabulous, this doesn't happen every day, I'm actually going to be thinking, well, this is somebody who actually wants to keep me safe for the future. This is not about what's wrong with me, this is about how, you know, how do I, how do I stay safe? And they've even started doing some fitness courses at the local fire service. So, you know, do I want to go into, a, you know, even now, at the age of 47, do I want to go into a gym surrounded by 22-year-olds with rippling muscles? No. But, um, you know, in 20 years' time, probably even less so. But, you know, to go into the fire service and do a little fitness course that just keeps me strong and healthy and active and independent, you know, I can't, you know, I can't think of anything yeah. better. Although I was very disappointed that the community health team wasn't allowed to use the fireman's pole. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Hugh will want to come back on that as we uh, perhaps uh, later in terms of the conversation about mm. how the fitness industry yeah. needs to respond so that not only uh, 40 and 50 somethings but 70 somethings might enjoy um, uh, using some of their <coughs> facilities. Um, we're going to come to the audience now so I'm just priming you to sort of get ready with your um, questions. Um, I might just take chair's privilege and ask you one short question before I open it up. <clears throat> you talked, you know, very um, positively about the economic opportunity. Do you think that UK PLC does genuinely see it as a business opportunity? I think it's, I think it's coming, but I, I just don't think, you know, and it, when you set, when you set it out in the way that I've tried to today, mm -hmm. you think it is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about the, this, you know, population as I've tried to uh, describe them. There are, there are many mm -hmm. and they are you know they have a lot of disposable income and but they're very discerning consumers you know and you would think that actually the the marketplace would be responding in a very positive way and it, it isn't always and i think mm -hmm. somehow we need to it's a, it's a, it's a culture change mm -hmm. uh, and and actually i think older people need to you know um, fight back a little bit and and uh, and say hold on you know where is the range of products for me uh, and um, and be a, you know use that <coughs> purchasing power. Um, and uh, but I, 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 to me, I was I was surprised at how little uh, you know innovation there is in, in this sector. But I, but um, Lance will know much more about this. <coughs> Okay, great. So um, we've got microphone coming around. If you could just say um, who you are uh, before asking your question. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Yes, Jill Sargent from Sargent's Associates. I was very interested in the today, and was particularly interested in Lance's question about the people on the cruise ship who have had a, 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 had a little fall dating, saying what happens when I get older. And I think the failure of everybody to deal with that one in ten is actually the really big challenge for us. It is, I mean, I'm talking to a neighbour whose mother was very active till 94, a bit like 
your uncle, very happy. Then got catastrophic care needs at 94, and they're having to sell the house, they can't get the money, and she's got um, and she's got two types of cancer. And I think it's that issue that actually is this real elephant in the room. I think we're doing huge strides with the others. But I think it's really sad. They're having a wonderful time on their cruise ship. What do they, you know, and yet they're thinking, their real, the real worry is, what can I do when I get older? And I think that is the real challenge of the ageing. How, I mean, I think we all have to look at it in terms of how business can deal with it. I mean, it's interesting that the business sector could, did, couldn't think of, you know, Saga couldn't get into the care needs because it was just catastrophic. Well, unless we deal with that, we are going to have a very unhappy <coughs> range of people. It's not just the 94 year olds. You know, if your lovely uncle would, ha you know, had to suddenly go into a care home, what would be a very happy life? Great, so I want to try and take a couple of questions if we can. So um, I encourage you to try and keep them brief. So, Hi, I'm Kat Drew. Um, I am director at Us Creates and we're a service design agency focusing on health and wellbeing. And what I was really encouraged to hear was all the examples of so much collaboration across the sector between health and, and social care. I just want to add in that um, we've just joined the Future Girl who are a um, service design organisation focusing on um, uh, local authorities. So we are kind of also mirroring what you're trying to achieve. And I just wanted to ask about kind of place-based approaches, because I think it's so exciting when you see these examples of um, organisations from across like local places, so businesses, fire, service, police, all coming together. And I wanted to ask, how can those be kind of facilitated? We just did a BBC Radio The Fix series where we do bring lots of different people from different backgrounds together and we did one around um, ageing in the rural economy and I just wonder how can we promote more of those kind of coming together at a local area to address these sorts of problems. Okay, I'm looking to see if there's one more. No? Okay, so we've got um, two, two questions there. I think this um, uh, idea that somehow the, the period of dependency, which obviously everybody gets at a different age, but on average there's sort of 18 <coughs> months or two years before we die, um, how much should we be focusing on the, the bit up to there in terms of the opportunities to keep people like you were talking about up till they're 94, fit, healthy, active, and that consumer market opportunity, um, and, and whether there is a sort of a drag on that because people are worrying, do I need to hold money back because of, of, of the uncertainty about the social care safety net? So that and then these sort of place-based approaches. Would, Shall I kick off and then yes. you'll yeah. nice hear from time. others because yeah. I talk too much. Um, uh, so I, I think I think it's actually you know, it's a very valid point, which is why we'll, we'll be setting out in the green paper later this year one of the ways we want to try and uh, some of the ways we want to try and tackle it and that long-term sustainability of funding and how you can risk pool, how you can give people a little bit of certainty about what is expected of them and what they can expect from the government in return. That's very much. The sort of conversation that we're going to be setting out in this green paper, but it is um, it, it is very much a consultation. We want to hear people's views, and so it's a conversation, and it's a conversation that sometimes people don't want to have, but as a nation we have to have. The point about uh, how you will work together is so vital, and I, you know, as, we've, as we've probably alluded to, it's so tricky to do it. And I think uh, from a government point of view, it's about sort of setting out the. Um, the aspiration. So I know my boss, um, Matt Hancock, has sort of come in and said he's got three priorities. One is workforce, one is technology, but the third is prevention. And I feel that a lot of this, this collaboration, has a very firm role in that prevention piece. And then a lot of it is about commissioning. It's about the way services are commissioned and not commissioning in silos. So it's about making sure that people who, who are doing that commissioning, like you say, the local authorities, the CCGs, and others, are commissioning in that broader uh, sort of way that keeps the individual at the centre and then arranges the services around them rather than this kind of revolving door of different people from different bodies all replicating what the other is doing and actually not delivering a particularly well-rounded service for the individual. Would you also like to pick up on either questions, quick comments from you? Uh, if I may, I'll just pick up very quickly on the, the question around care and how to make, possibly how to make that work. I mean, I think the answer, there's three parts to it. The first is, 
but of availability of labour. Uh, and that's where whatever happens with Brexit, and I won't state a political point of view on that, but whatever happens, we need to make sure that we still have the availability of large numbers of people who want to work in care. Uh, so uh, whether that's Europeans or whether it's Brits, uh, but if the Brits are going to go off and fill vacancies that were filled previously by EU citizens, that's going to create a shortfall in labour, and the care industry is incredibly labour intensive. Uh, so we really need to watch for that one. Second one's availability of money. Um, uh, now, you know, we're, we're lucky in one sense in that the majority, just over the majority of the older age group owned their homes. And there's a lot of money tied up in their homes. And the question is, how can one create an equity release environment that is fair rather than punitive, which is something we're working on um, and would be delighted to pick up and discuss with the minister at some point. Now the third I think is use of technology, which you touched on several times in your speech. Um, smart use of technology I think can make the, the care burden significantly lighter on average and that's something that we're doing a lot of work on as well. If we get those three parts right, then I think we can crack it for half to two thirds of the population. The government I think have a critical role to play <coughs> the other third, which is where people don't own their home, don't have money, don't have access to the technology. Uh, on the service design bit, I just wanted to pick up on that because our role is to make life better by design. It doesn't matter what age you are. We're not, we don't do it chronologically. That was by biological, not chronological. And we have run a program over the last three years called Transform Aging in the southwest of England, which is all about bringing different people together. So to your point, it brings together the chief exec of NHS, uh, say in Cornwall, the chief exec of a council, people in later life, social entrepreneurs, designers, they would never ever sit around a table together. And they together then designed what they thought would transform aging. And out of that has come completely different things than if we sat there and said, well, we think it should be X or Y or Z. And in particular, what was so interesting is that the commissioners uh, realized that they could then commission very differently. So it's exactly your point, it's how you design the commissioning, I think, <coughs> is key. So the chief exec then of the councils would come into us to say, actually, we want to run our whole organization differently. Can you help us do that? And that is exactly what we do. So it'd be interesting to talk to you about that. Yeah, just to reiterate um, around sort of integration of services and facilities and following on what the minister said, um, we're working with Sport England on a, on a program looking at wellness hubs and, the, and the, the rollout of wellness hubs are around 40 or 50 already in the country which have been co-funded by sporting with, with third parties. The opportunity here is to see integrated facilities which are not just sport and leisure but also libraries, GP facilities, community spaces. Um, the success story of it so far is that they've worked, they work very well in terms of sustained usage. You're seeing not only co-location but integration of the facility as well. So the individual within the local community feels that this is at the heart of their of their community and they get great usage. The opportunity now with private funding on the table with the Treasury is to take that from 50 to 300 in the next 10 years, which would be, we feel will be quite transformative um, for you know local communities the length and breadth of the nation. So I think we're about to uh, have to uh, let uh, uh, Caroline go. Am so I'm being whisked off, am I? Uh, I never I, get to stay at the good thing. Yeah, <laughs> so I just wondered if uh, there was any sort of final remarks that you might like to, to make uh, on this subject that we've been debating this morning. No, well, I mean, it, you know, it's, um, it's so important. It touches every single person's life. It's, uh, there are, um, but you know, back to my original comments, we need to see this as an opportunity. We need to see living longer as, um, as a good thing. Uh, and we need to make sure that we, as a society, are embracing the, um, the opportunities that, that, that come with it. Uh, and, you know, and for me, if we can do that, that is a win-win situation because you have people living longer, more fulfilling, happier, more healthy lives, and you have um, an industry that's sort of built up to support them to do it, and, and the economic advantages that come with it. Good. Um, but we, these are the experts, yeah. so actually, you know, let, let, let them tell you. <laughs> And we look forward to working both with um, officials in your department and at Bayes to obviously take forward some of the work on the industrial strategy yeah. and particularly the Healthy Ageing Challenge Fund, um, which um, we think there's some great opportunities to really galvanise new partnerships with business. So um, very exciting. But thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I just invite the audience to join me in thanking the Minister as she leads us. Thank you.
sit tight and uh, don't uh, uh, leave us if you're following online because we've got time now to really dig into some of those issues with our um, expert panel here. You've also already had a taste of some of their insights and uh, reflections. But um, we're going to just give them a little bit more chance uh, before we go back into a sort of QA and discussion uh, to give uh, just a few minutes of their own uh, reflections on this subject of how business uh, can meet the grand challenge on ageing. So, um, Lance, obviously, Saga, you're a consumer-facing business. Uh, do you want to share with us your thoughts uh, about this sure. um, uh, opportunity as well as challenge? Yeah, sure, Emma, thanks. Can everyone hear me? Uh, I used to run a pizza company. Uh, I see a Domino's Pizza, and all my kids thought I was really cool. Um, in fact, apparently I won the Coolest Dad Award at their school. And then one day I came home at dinner and I said to them, I'm leaving Domino's, and their face fell. Uh, and they said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to run a company called Saga. And they looked blankly at me and said, what's Saga? And I said, it's insurance and travel for older people. And they haven't spoken to me uh, in the five or six years since. Why would someone leave Domino's, which is all about fun and um, hugely profitable, and frankly not that hard to run, because it sells itself. Why would someone leave there to, to run Saga? The, the answer, people in this room will understand almost better than anybody. It's the most exciting space for any of us to spend our careers operating in. I looked at Saga five years ago when I was offered the role, and what I saw was, as you all know, an extraordinary demographic. Um, you know, there are uh, over age 75 at the moment. That, that age group is going to go up by about 73% in scale in the next 20 years. That's an enormous growth. Uh, and as the minister said earlier on, these, these folks are extremely savvy. Um, they're well off. Uh, they're demanding. Uh, and they want to enjoy their lives. Um, why wouldn't one want to work with a group of people like that? I also thought, here's a business that's actually been around for 50 or 60 years now. It's very much trusted in that age group, but hadn't been exploited to the full. When I looked at the database, I saw 10 million names and thought, well, what are we really doing with that, other than renewing people's insurance? We're not really mining the data to find out what customers want. Uh, I looked at the relationship with our customers, and when I spoke to them, and I went and met a lot of them, what they said to me was they think of themselves as members of Saga. There's something about the Saga brand name, as, you, as some of you in this room know, I'll be careful, as some people in this room will know, when you, you cannot reach the age of 50 in the UK without being aware of the Saga brand name. You've got 98% awareness in the over 50s. You, I mean, I turned 54 years ago, and uh, my, my cards that I got from friends, about half of them had Saga jokes on the front. I think having a brand that's trusted and known by 98% of the over 50s a brand that's synonymous with retirement in the UK is an extraordinary opportunity to begin with. Then you start to look at the business opportunities that, that are there. We already do a lot in insurance. We have done travel and cruise for 60 years, which is what we're really known for. But as we've been touching on earlier in the conversation, there's, there's uh, money and wealth management. When you speak to our customers, uh, they will tell you that there are very few products out there that they really feel have been tuned to their needs. They're just expected to get by with the same products and services that were designed for working people uh, who are 20, 30 years younger. There's health care and the domiciliary care challenge that we touched on with the minister earlier on. Uh, and uh, interestingly, when I looked at the database, I found exactly what Caroline said earlier on. Uh, there was one segment, the over 50s. And I arrived at Saga and asked the marketing team there, you know, who, who do we look after? Who are our customers? And the answer is the over 50s. <laughs> Uh, now, in my earlier career, if I had described all of our customers uh, as being one segment, everyone would have laughed at me. The idea that everyone below 50 falls into one segment is ludicrous. So how on earth can the over 50s fall into one segment as well? And one of the first things we did was work with CACI to design a 13-segment breakdown of the over 50 age group. And the moment we got to that, we then started speaking to those different categories about what their needs were in health and wealth and leisure and so on. And the new product ideas started to bubble up immediately. And we've started to flow those into the market now, whether it's new purpose-designed cruise ships for a specific demographic, 
uh, or whether it's uh, new types of equity release, which have been going extremely well for us for a specific demographic of over 50s. The other thing we did that I'll just round off with is we redefined the company as from being a transactional company that sells stuff to you to instead being a club that you belong to. And it's very interesting because I think there is a there is a real need amongst the if one's still allowed to use the word retired generation, because I'm not sure that's a fair descriptor anymore. And if, everyone, if anyone's got a better phrase, please let me have it. But for those who are no longer working full time, the desire to belong uh, and to have a linkage of some sort is absolutely critical. And it's fascinating to me that it's only been about a year since we did that, and we've already got about a million people who have signed up as members of Saga, which fundamentally redefines the relationship we have with them enables us to communicate with each other and to start building some of the communities that we've, we've been talking about earlier on. Uh, and you know, we're talking to uh, a number of uh, other companies and partners, something in the room, uh, about how one could build on that community concept, which I think is the future uh, for a business like ours. So I could not be more excited uh, by the opportunity of operating in that sector. I think British business has so far missed a trick when I look at our competitors in insurance, in, in financial products, in uh, travel, there's very few of them that single-mindedly focus on the older generation. They tend to focus on the mass, the middle of the market, or the new entry. They're more excited about signing a 25-year-old up on, on his or her car insurance than they are about providing an amazing service for an 80-year-old, uh, which frankly is a, leaves an open playing field for Saga. Uh, but I think others should get in there. Okay, well, we'll have time for questions in a minute, but thank you, Lance. So, Sarah, turning to, to you. So, in terms of design, our purpose is making life better by design. And as I said earlier, that's not to do with age, it's to do with for everybody. And we think about that in four ways, all of which are relevant for this discussion. So, better places means not just homes, but thinking about homes, infrastructure, and jobs. Where do you live? Is there a bus stop nearby? Can you then get to a job? And that can be whether you're 70 or whether you are 30. Uh, better products, which people often think is what design is, you know, designing a glass or a cup or whatever, whatever. But the most important one is design processes. And that is the thing that sort of underlies, you know, it's how you design your insurance products. It's how you design, I mean, yes, you have to design the cruise ship, but you also have to design the journey for the person to get to the cruise ship. That is all design. If you get all of that right, you get better performance. And about three, we're in our third year now, we started a program called Transform Aging in the Southwest. I mentioned it briefly earlier. And that was to think about how you could, using a sort of service design method that you mentioned, get together very different groups of people who would never normally sit round tables together to think about how you transform aging. And it's in it, because it's a prototype project, it, it's funded by the big lottery, and it's sort of shifted and changed. And what is interesting about it is that uh, Devon, Cornwall, and Somerset uh, each think of themselves as very, very different. So Cornwall, you know, whenever you're there, they say, oh, yeah, but we're not like Devon. You know, we do things differently, so older people here will do things differently. And actually, they have come up with slightly different things that they want. So it's all about what works in the local place. And then they, they come up with the ideas, and then social enterprises are developing them. And often what has happened is the people that sat around those tables then bid for the money to be the social <coughs> entrepreneurs. And they could have been in their, I mean, we didn't ask people's ages, they could have been in their 50s or 60s or 70s. So they are then becoming these new businesses. So I think that's been interesting. And actually, we've been working with Anna, so Centre for Aging Better are a partner with us on that. The other thing that's relevant to this conversation is uh, we have a programme, so we, we run research, national research, about the design economy. And just to be clear, so when we talk about the economy, we mean right across the economy. So it's about 68% of people who have design skills, and those skills are head, heart, and hand. So the head skill is being able to conceptualise and visualise something you can't necessarily see in front of you right at this moment. The heart skill is having the curiosity and interest <coughs> to ask the person or groups of people what challenge they have to which you are going to design a solution, because design solves problems. And then the hand skill is the coding or the drawing or the CAD drawing or whatever is the technical skill needed. And those three things together make up design. 
So 68% of people who have those skills don't work in design, they work in finance and banking and insurance and auto automation and uh, transport right across our economy, of which there are people of all generations needing all of those services. And we then run programs. <coughs> and the second program, we're, again, we're going to be partnering with Centre for Aging Better, is one called Spark. And it's about people designing, coming onto the program, having, uh, having, knowing somebody who has a challenge and they want to design a solution. So again, they're not designers. I mean, one person this year was a surgeon. And he found that he was doing a lot of operations on children who had trapped their finger in the door and lost the top of their finger. And he was thinking, this is taking up quite a lot of my time. And then his son did the same thing. He thought, there must be a way to design something to stop the door slamming on the child's finger. But of course, because he's not a designer, he didn't quite know how to do all of that. So he comes on the programme, and he and his wife actually together have designed this thing called Stop a Door, which does exactly what it says, stop a door. And so we have people of all ages. There was a, an older gentleman, again, I don't know his age, but he designed a plug that would be really easy to pull out of the wall. Do you know how difficult it is to pull the plug out if you have limited mobility or any sort of frailty? And he's designed something called Easy Plug, and you just pull it straight out of the wall, and it's being prototyped at the moment. So what we do is we help people build up those design skills, those marketing skills, make sure they get their IP right, they understand how they're going to reach their audience, and we're shifting the emphasis this year onto things that are particularly to do with how you might carry on living in your home uh, more easily with any particular adaptations or things that will make your life uh, better, but get those products to market. Because lots of people have great ideas, lots of people can design things, but you've got to get it into the market and then sell it big time. Because th there aren't breakthroughs in this area, there are lots of little things happening, but what we want to do is to change the system so that actually it then just becomes the norm that you find interesting products that you can buy. And I'll end by just saying on, on a, a personal note, I s can't wait for this to happen because my um, mother and father both live with dementia. So over a 10 year period, because I'm interested in this sort of thing, I spent a lot of my time looking for things that would make their life better. And I had, had to search quite hard to find things. And then they would get sent to me, it was a radio, it, was, it doesn't really matter what they were. And they would arrive in sort of, you know, wrapped in brown paper, and they mainly came from universities. And I kept thinking to myself, why do we do things in such a Heath Robinson sort of a way? This is a massive marketplace, and yet I'm getting something which comes to me, often it was Bath University, and it just felt so sort of random and small. And um, it struck me that we just aren't doing things on a big enough scale. The other thing that struck me is, why does everything have to be grey? Why does everything have to be grey? I mean, everything I was buying, a lot of them were grey. So I would uh, say let, what we want to do is to design things differently, design them well, and then scale them up so that the marketplace is right across the economy. Um, exciting, and mm -hmm. I think as you know, Sarah, we had a recent event around home adaptations and we were lucky enough to have Nick Knowles come from DIY yeah. SOS. And he was observing that you know one of the things that his designers do is make the house look fantastic. And so when people go into those homes, they basically say, oh, it doesn't look like a disability home or a, an adapted yeah. home. And um, I think there is a, there is a real need uh, for these products and services to also look good, um, as well as to have that utility um, yeah. that you describe. So uh, third panelist, Hugh, you, you're going to touch a little bit on how um, your sector is looking to transform mm. itself or reimagine itself yeah. for an ageing population. Yeah, thanks, Anna. I mean, this is a very exciting opportunity for the physical activity sector, and probably the core of my membership is, membership is that fitness and leisure sector. Um, I think the, the narrative around the ageing society, a healthy life expectancy, um, is well documented. You know, the fact that, you know, as we do get older, we do become less active, you know, it really drops up to a sort of 40% after the age of 55. That inactivity contributes to 20 preventable conditions that we that we suffer from as a, as a society. And so the opportunity to, for us as a sector is to recognize you know, what is our ability to contribute um, effectively and substantially to the wider conversation of, of this big societal challenge. Um, we start with data, right? And you know, I think the fact is that for part of my sector, which is probably the community leisure, we know 
great levels of data. We were, we're accessed 500 million visits over the last day, over the last decade in terms of data analysis, and we know that you know 100 million of those visits are are people who are over 55, so 20 percent. Um, but that doesn't reflect society. So over 33 percent of society is over 55. So there is a marketing gap. So I have to recognise my own sector that there is a there is a um, a gap in terms of the offer which is currently here. And so we're, we are very energized about this and seeing where we can work in collaboration and partnership with a great broad variety of, of organizations. I think it's probably three areas. The first is around the infrastructure. I think community leisure is, you know, is, is, is a very important asset and is other, obviously coming under a lot of pressure from local authority austerity um, and, and local authorities having to face significant challenges in some of the decisions they make, some which is non-statutory. That is why we're, we're keen to work with local authorities and, and the government and the private sector to recognise that. We recognise the importance. And moments of extreme, especially last year in, in Manchester uh, tragedy and in Grenfell, you know, that communities were, community leisures where people went. They went as the harbour in the storm for a lot of people. And so what is it we need to do to work with local communities to build that infrastructure, something which is completely inclusive, can work with all different age groups, and is integrated in terms of services? The second is that we have to look at our own sector and think about what products, services we are providing, how we're working with the, that cohort, that age group, to understand what they would really want. Um, to make, and there isn't a one size fits all approach to that. Some people want to have, and, and learning a lot from America, bespoke classes um, for people over 55 and 60. That doesn't work for everybody, so there needs to be that adaptability of offer. We can't be one size fits all approach. Uh, we need to look at our own workforce, and the minister mentioned that. Um, one of, the, one of the, the recommendations from our recent report, Reimagine Aging, was around having an older workforce reflected within our own, in our own sector. Um, this led to 70, 80 people phoning the office and, and, our, and emailing our office over the next couple of weeks saying, I want to become a personal trader, including an 80, 82 year old man who came up to our summit the following day. Fantastic reaction. That doesn't have to be a, a trained personal trainer, that could be an activator in a local community setting. Right? So there's a real opportunity for us to make sure that our offer is, resonates with that individual as, as well, that individual uh, grouping as well. Uh, and the third is, is technology. Um, really excited about you know, the conversations we're now having with the, 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 the technology sector to think about innovative ways of, of attracting greater fusion between the physical activity sector and the technology sector. We, was, we had an event last night on this and the head of, head of health and wellbeing for Apple was talking about the stereotype that older people don't understand technology, right? You know, both of my parents have got iPhones, right? They know what's going on. Um, and so there is, and they're in their late 70s, so they know, the, they know the game here, but there's also some great innovation coming into, into the sector to maintain that independence for that individual. We work with a couple of companies, uh, uh, Memoride, which is about physical activity, and it's gone on a screen where you can actually go and, um, and cycle in your house, like on an exercise bike through uh, countryside and, 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 and the heritage sites, which you know historically. Then there's Walk With Park, who, who are basically putting um, insoles in which can actually support balance in individuals, so addressing issues of, of falling, which then maintains that level of independence. There is a journey we're on as a sector, but I think you know, it's very important that our sector uh, contributes um, effectively to this, this grand challenge. I think there's a lot for us to, to provide. Great. Thank you very much. So uh, we've got still about half an hour for a discussion and debate with our panel. Um, so again, sort of priming you to be ready uh, with your um, questions and um, comments. One thing that I would just like to put to you before we open up is, um, I suppose we've talked a lot about inclusivity, and by that I think we're often thinking about inclusive of people of all ages, inclusive of people of all abilities. I'm very uh, conscious from the work that we've done that there are also huge um, socio-economic inequalities uh, within uh, people in later life. And um, the extent to which here we are, we're talking up the business opportunity, we're talking about uh, you know, the, the fact that there are people who have equity in homes who do have uh, disposable spending. But we also know um, from our own research that there are about uh, 1.8 million uh, lower and middle income households in that age group between 50 and state pension age. And we do know that there are still many people in um, pension age who are struggling financially or uh, who rely on the state pension. So I wondered if you might all comment about how do we make sure that in harnessing this business opportunity, um, that we also um, make sure that uh, these sort of products and services are affordable 
and um, don't actually um, increase sort of inequalities. So just a bit of a challenge, I think, to bring into the conversation before we open up. Would anybody like to have a go at that? I was just conscious there was a lot of talk of cruises last. Yeah, <laughs> no, you're right. Uh, I'm very aware of that because our customers are uh, biased towards ABC1 married with some money. And it, I wrestle with that a lot of the time. But Saga exists to help people enjoy their retirement, and we should be trying to help everybody enjoy their retirement. It was one of the reasons that I was excited when I joined the business that we owned another business, the, help, uh, the, the domiciliary care business that I touched on <coughs> earlier on, because there was a profound sense of mission of wanting to be able to help the whole of, of the UK population over a certain age. And that's what I was touching on earlier on when I said we couldn't make the economics work. We ended up subsidizing it to try and keep it going. And it was in danger of bringing the whole company down. Mm -hmm. Because as, as minimum wage went up, um, the margins evaporated. And quite rightly, CQC and government expect very high standards in that sector. They should. The trouble is there's no money left at the end. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we're a private company owned by shareholders. We're not a charity. And we're not, a, and we're not an arm of government. But I still wrestle with that because I don't feel that we're performing the full role that we should and could perform. I just don't know how to get in in order to help. Now, one thing we're doing that's of interest, perhaps, is that we are piloting our way back into the, the, the domiciliary care sector using technology, well-paid carers, uh, looking after Saga members of a certain age, and we're learning lessons there which I'm hoping, once they've scaled, we can take and transfer over into the subsidized care sector. So for example, we've built a technology platform which ensures that carers get to the right house on time. Um, they've got the, the, um, the meds all sorted out. They've got an escalation route if someone's unwell, etc., etc. I would love to get that to a scale mm. where it's been tested, where we could almost hand it to, um, to other care companies and say, look, this works. Yeah. Um, and that would take cost out of the whole care sector. But it's a, it's a real issue. Anybody yeah. else? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I agree. I'm, I'm glad you said that, actually, because I thought I don't want to be the one to come in and start dissing cruises. But uh, yeah. I think yeah, it, 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 it's, the, it's a shorthand, isn't it? And yeah. we have to be careful yeah. not to do that. So when we're talking about making life better by design, again, that's not just for certain people, that's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And when we were doing the Transform Aging project, or which we're still doing in the, in the Southwest, what was incredibly important was that we needed to work with people who were on the ground there, who lived there, who worked there, who could reach some of the people that you are talking about. Because if you just open your doors and you're saying, oh, we're going to do this new program, Transform Aging, and think that everybody is going to just jump through that door and go, yes, here I am. Well, they're not. They're absolutely not. Because if you are sitting maybe alone in your home and you are on a very low income, and that's exacerbated at the moment, particularly for women who suddenly are retiring now, thought they were going to get their state pension at 60 and now it's 67, and some of them are in you know, terrible deprivation. If you're living in the Southwest where transport is poor anyway, uh, you don't even hear about this transform aging program. You can't get there. You haven't got the money to you know, allow you to uh, move around and have taxis, etc. So what we did is we worked with community groups who then reached out to those people because we don't necessarily know them. And often the most interesting people are the people that you don't know. And then they come and they bring a very different view. And money was discussed quite often, actually, about the products or services that were going to be developed. Is I remember sitting at a table and, and a, an elder lady who'd been quite quiet because I think people didn't come around these tables together. So she, might, she was with the chief exec of um, Cornwall Council. And I think was feeling a little bit reticent about where's my voice. You know, she's a rather important person, whereas actually it's just about everybody's voices. And she just quite quietly said, but what's this going to cost? And it sort of brought everyone up short, because they were all gaily, you know, off on them, we'll do this idea and that idea, but nobody had thought about the cost, and then who would be able to buy that service or not. So I think it's about being much more open, and it's the heart part of design, is have the curiosity and interest to ask the right questions that's your point. So I think it's business, public sector, private sector working together. I wonder also if the Social Value Act, which came in in 2012 and is going to be mandatory 
from 2019, led by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, which means that, so this is a sort of an update really on uh, corporate social responsibility. But when people are bidding for contracts, they have to, they have to not just tick a box going, oh yeah, we're going to think about um, social value, whatever that might mean. Actually, they have to really consider who it's going to reach, why it's going to reach those people, <coughs> what, it's going to, what it's going to do. And I wonder if that might shift things as well. Yeah, um, and echo what Sarah just said, you know, one of the things you know, I mentioned in, in the minister is around sort of a lot of my members are obviously commercial enterprises, of course, right? And you know, they they are they are keen to find <coughs> a opportunities in which they can provide, you know, as an inclusive an offer across their across their operations. They do have, you know, a lot of latent demand across the whole, you know, across a, a, a day, right? And so there comes this underutilized capacity in the system. They want to utilize that capacity, then it's a conversation with other partners about how best to do that. But one of the things that could happen was actually removing some of the, the costs which are associated with physical activity, right? And that, obviously, if physical activity supports the health of the individual, supports the health of the nation, remove VAT from all costs associated with that, then we can actually start looking at the benefits which that would have seen as well. Mm, okay. Right, so please indicate if you'd like to come in with a question or comment and we'll get the microphone to you. So there's one over here. Thank you. I'm an um, international student uh, who study uh, public policy and aging at King's College London. Mm -hmm. And before I came here, I saw uh, older people in the UK every day go to the pub <laughs> and <laughs> talk with each other. And so I was really surprised when I heard these days older people don't go to the pub. Uh, because um, buying beer or wine at Tesco or Sainsbury is much cheaper than going to the pub. <laughs> and um, it um, leads old people to get more isolated than before. Sure. So I would like to ask is, what I would like to, uh, sorry, what I would like to ask is, what can business or design do to avoid such kind of isolation? Great, fantastic question. Um, and we hear lots about closures of pubs, but uh, Kirsty. Hi, I'm Kirsty Woodard from Aging Without Children. Um, probably a comment, may, maybe a question. Um, first of all, we're part of the Transform Aging Programme in the Southwest, so I'd just like to endorse everything that Sarah's <laughs> been saying about it, because it's fabulous. Um, and I was really interested in what Saga was saying about their 13 market segments of the over 50s. 20% um, of people over the age of 50 don't have children, um, but society and business and public services still work on the basis that you know all older people are grandparents and everybody's got a family and everybody's got somebody. So I think there is something which is really about designing for diversity, so because the older population is so diverse. Um, and I would like to hear kind of like a bit more about that, about how can we design for the diversity of the older population. Great, good couple of questions. So do you want to pick that question up yeah. straight away, Sarah? Uh, can I, I'll come to your question. Yes, as soon as you said who you were, I said, oh, I recognise them, they're part of Transform Aging. <laughs> that wasn't applied in there, you were going to be here. That's, that's, <laughs> that's very nice. Uh, designing for diversity. So my simple answer to that is include different people in the design that you are developing. Uh, that sounds very straightforward. It actually isn't always straightforward. It's a bit like when I was asking the minister about joined up government. Of course I know that that's extraordinarily difficult, but I do think that it is the way that we need to go. So if you get different people around <coughs> a table to design what they want, they might come up with something quite different. To give you one example of that, the Whittington Hospital, which is a large hospital in North London, has a huge number of people coming through it uh, to collect uh, their, the, the drugs from their pharmacy. And it was, it was a bit of a disaster. It was often um, people were very agitated. They couldn't understand the system. They had to wait for a long time. It wasn't working. They, the hospital, tried to redesign it. They sent out questionnaires. They asked people what they wanted. They spent some money on redesigning it. It didn't work. People were very, very angry, writing angry letters. And the chief pharmacist then took a very different tack. So she got in the people who were writing the angry letters and we worked with them and put in some designers to work with these people as well. So we had the people who were really fed up sitting in the room and they redesigned the space themselves and literally using sort of sticky tape and, uh, and bits of cardboard to begin with to try things out, see what worked, see what didn't work. And people of all ages came in and it took quite a long time and it was quite a difficult process 
but they got through it, and what they wanted to do was three things. Calm things down so that people weren't agitated and anxious. Uh, say to people it's not just about taking a drug, it could also be about your lifestyle, to your point of view, and they wanted to sell people things. So they've now turned themselves into a community interest company, they've set up the, the, the Whittington space, is completely different now, they're outside the NHS, they don't pay VAT, that saves the NHS 20%, people are getting different messages, and it's all calm and lovely. And the chief pharmacist, who's nothing to do with design at all, said design made the difference, but it was co-design. It was designed with diversity. Great. So um, pubs, I mean, in a, in a sense, the fact that uh, people are drinking less, we might think might be good for healthy aging. Uh, but, um, you know, you've talked a lot about the need for sort of community hubs, yeah. the extent to which uh, pubs have provided that in the past. Yeah. Where, where are the places and spaces for a, people to meet? 100%. And it's a, it's a really good question. You know, actually, the fabric of you know, historical communities, I think the Brexit Nation has been around the, the pub and the pub, you know, public house where, you know, it's there, you know, to socialise but also address issues of isolation, you know, and, you know, read with great interest worth looking at the, you know, the government strategy around loneliness, which was published last week, which was, you know, has a cross-departmental ambition. It's looking at the fabric of our society across all ages and understanding what, how do you address those issues of, long, of isolation. Um, you know, there are... You know, going back to some of the, you know, I don't think, you know, the community asset and the wellness hub is a direct replacement, but there are opportunities there to bring in across, um, you know, people from across all communities into those spaces. But, you know, there is a vacuum there. But you actually want to have the, uh, a place where, you know, you know, places like a pub or places like a community asset reflect the diversity of the community in which are living in that area. Um, and I think. You know, some of the challenges around social behaviour, around isolation, are coming from the fact that some of the fundamental fabric we have in our society has been has been lost for various different reasons. Uh, and so, it's a real challenge in terms of supporting organisations who are trying to readdress that. You know, we we're talking about the Cares family earlier. You know, wonderful charity worth looking at in terms of the work they're doing, uh, bringing younger people together with older people, and in a really respectful way of learning about each other's lives. You know, there's there's projects there, but. You know, unless there is that supportive infrastructure there to support the local community, then there's, there will remain a vacuum. Mm. So, Lance, I'm really interested in who you've got in your 13 segments. I, I'm not mm. sure if it's commercially yeah. confidential, but give us, a, I suppose, a taste of how much does it pick up, really, the, the true diversity, and uh, um, how do we make sure we don't make assumptions, uh, whether that's that people do have children, adult children, who can yep. sort of care for them? Uh, so it is commercially confidential, but that said, if you look at a fairly traditional segmentation model for the under 50s, if I can draw the line at that point, it's very interesting that some of the biases that drive people into individual segments in our new segmentation model are indeed related to the size of family, uh, their access to support um, from, from nearby friends and so on. Uh, and there's a very clear correlation between people's uh, financial security and sense of security and willingness to carry on learning and growing and, and moving forward in life with their connection to others, uh, which totally ties into what I think everyone has been saying here. And so there are two or three segments in our 13 which are the, uh, the least likely to want to interact with us as a business, and they are very closely correlated to people who, who don't have a support network. And interestingly, because we are, as a business aren't equipped to try and deal with those segments at the moment, one thing we've done is to partner with Silverline, which is, mm. as you probably know, is Esther Ranson's charity. And a lot of our staff have been volunteering to do calls. So we're now talking to those segments, mm. not f from a business sense, but just because we want to try to do something in, the, in those parts of the market that we don't reach. Yeah. You did yeah. describe, though, that now you've got a different relationship as you've uh, opened up membership and sort of creating communities. How can a business like Starbucks sort of promote social connection? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's early days for us. I and mean, the start of our membership scheme, which we call Possibilities, has been around uh, current customers <coughs> converting their status to be members. And then uh, they get a combination of savings at all sorts of high street, um, high street venues. Did you know, by the way, that you can save 9% on Apple products if you're a Saga member? I don't know where else you can do that. I'll make everyone's favourite. Thank you, everyone's favourite. Um, but also, we're, we're moving now into the community space. And 
I think what we're trying to do, we, we haven't got venues, but what we're trying to do is to provide a platform whereby our members, a million of them today, and I hope two million in a year's time, uh, can meet each other and start, and, and there is evidence this will happen, that if you provide the introductions and the common interest mm. between them, that they will then trigger and start to create mm. their own communities. Yeah. Right? If after all they have, that they've been on holiday with us um, in common, uh, that gives them a start point uh, of interest. They might have you know, traveled somewhere, for example. Um, it's early days. Yeah. Uh, I think we're still learning is the answer. Yeah. Could be a nice partnership, Lance. <laughs> Definitely worth talking. Yeah. OK, yeah. we've got yeah. time for a uh, last couple of questions. So um, lady at the back, yes? Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, well done, everyone. Um, I'm just thinking, you're talking about intergenerational work. We typically see quite a lot of young people doing startups, mm. uh, using a lot of technology. And I wondered if you thought that there was um, a difference between how the big kind of corporate businesses try to um, engage um, with aging and uh, some of the um, the more kind of uh, recent startups. Great question. I'm going to try and take three. There's a gentleman here and then a gentleman here. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Gordon Anderson from Memory Tracks. It's really a, a question about funding for innovation. Uh, which, as a, as a new company, uh, I've been involved in innovation in companies for companies for decades. For a new company, it's really, really hard in this space. Um, we don't seem to fit into accelerators very well, unless they're specifically age set accelerators. And, um, and innovation funding is very difficult to achieve. And there are lots of great ideas out there. I meet them at lots of events. And we don't seem to have, we don't get the traction we need into market. So, a question really to guys there who have some. Uh, influence and, uh, in the space, and uh, any advice you might have to, to small businesses trying to get traction. Great, complimentary questions, and third one here. Hi there, um, I'm John T. Reeves from Boomer and Beyond. We're, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Brandon. <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, good night last night. Um, <laughs> out with my parents, if I coincidence, thank you. Um, I'm from Boomer and Beyond. We're a, a brand and research agency focusing solely on the 55 plus audience, so this is all music to my ears, this is great. Um, I think it's really a comment on the isolation point, the really good uh, sort of community-led isolation point, that uh, we've recently run two uh, quant-based surveys, 1,000 strong, uh, across the UK, um, asking primarily around later living, but when asked specifically around uh, the type of amenities and products that people want nearby, pretty much without exception, uh, and particularly in the Northwest especially, the desire for uh, specifically pubs, but also uh, general f and so um, kind of cafes, bars, restaurants. Almost everybody came back and said they wanted that uh, it, within easy kind of walking distance, if not on the actual, uh, uh, kind of within the actual community itself. And then also to the intergenerational point, um, rather than having the classic um, siloed um, retirement community where it's solely 65 plus, mm -hmm. which obviously is partly a planning consent, uh, there's a massive desire for intergenerational, which increases as we get older, but also um, I think the fact that they want those facilities to be, if they are within the scheme, they want those facilities to actually be open to the public, so they get a, a broader community there, much more of a buzz, much more of a kind of dynamic uh, lifestyle going on. So I think it's really, the desire is definitely there for the pubs. <coughs> Not everybody wants to go to Sainsbury's and Tesco's to buy cheap beer. I think everybody still wants that. It's just making sure that they're available on people's doorsteps. Yeah, and I certainly know in Manchester there's been some fun initiatives to get clubs, <coughs> uh, some of the famous uh, Manchester uh, nightclub scene to open up to be more accessible and inclusive for um, some of the um, ageing uh, Happy Monday and uh, fans that uh, still yeah. live in Manchester. <laughs> Um, so um, th we have a sort of, uh, sort of few minutes, so um, perhaps some quick responses uh, from the, the panel. Innovation, startups, yes. accelerator funding, Sarah. Okay, I'll go on that one, yes. So that's why we started Spark, actually, because people who have great ideas weren't able to get their ideas to market. I don't know what your stuff is, but we have Spark, look on our website. Otherwise, I'm sure that you will know about Innovate UK, British Design Fund. What we try to do is signpost people once, because we're at quite early stage, and then once they go further on, sh show them the other places that they can go. Crowdfund them, we work with, with all of those. So I'm happy to have a, a chat to you, I suppose, is a quick answer. Great. Can, can I just build on that by saying that the challenge for 
uh, product services ideas like the ones you're talking about, even when you work with Spark, is how do we get those in front of the right audience? Yeah, and exactly. that's something we're thinking about hard. Yeah. Because if we get to a place, which I hope we will, where we have two, three, four million members, why wouldn't we create a marketplace where we can put in front of them yeah. all the products and services that have been designed for people like them and let them self-select? You know, yeah. We're not a, a, a retailer. But why not create a place where recommended products and services are available for, for sellers? So let's, let's do that. Sounds good. Sounds good. We can do that together. Do that. Great. There we go. The same partnership. We like it when an event isn't just a, 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 a discussion and debate, but it leads to action. So it looks like we've already got a couple of very uh, tangible things um, because I do think the ability to take those products to scale exactly. and to reach big Absolutely. markets yeah. and yeah. and uh, so Star so just making it. an offer to, to get to, <laughs> to product. Well look our, our members benefit if they get access to wonderful products and services yeah. that's what it's yeah. all about that's why we exist. Yeah, yeah we got yeah. we've got a program accelerator program for this called Active Lab um, where we put the, the, the winners you know go through sort of a dragon's den sort of cohort of 12 stick them in front of the sector and they look to see where they can you know, what is the best idea which will evolve their business going forward as well. So, uh, does anyone want to just pick up the point about, yeah. I can't remember what, you might know, so the Scandinavian country where they've got residential care with student university things. Denmark. Yeah, I think it might be, yeah. Denmark. It's quite a great example of yeah. sort of integration of yeah. all yeah. across yeah. the yeah. generation. Although, interestingly, that's, it's unfortunately, the minutes have gone, that's um, state-funded. Yeah. yeah, that's um, right. So, they, they put, they, basically, the students live rent-free uh, on the commitment that they put in 30 hours yeah. a week, I believe, yeah. Um, yeah. of contact of some yeah. kind, which I think they so enjoy. So certainly the research that we've recently um, published with Greater Manchester about um, the sort of housing market um, on right-sizing definitely suggests that there is a gap in the market for mainstream housing. So obviously, as we talked about, when people get uh, to a stage where they are frail and perhaps need extra care ha housing, there's, there's a specialist market. But there's a missing market in mainstream general housing where people want to live alongside people of all ages. But what they do want to have the confidence is that that home is going to be adaptable and going to enable them to live a full and independent life for as long as possible. And that's why as part of our work in the future in terms of new housing, we are really campaigning that all new homes should be built to accessible standards so that they can be lifetime homes. Um, and I think we need to get away from this idea of it being about specialists, both the specialists sort of with care, but even the age-specific housing. While that might suit some people, there's definitely um, evidence to suggest that there's a missing uh, market and that we haven't got that diversity of supply. So, um, so that would be, um, um, I guess, uh, my response to the sort of how do we build for intergenerational um, living. And as part of that, um, I think as a report out this morning shows, there need to be uh, local services, uh, not just GP surgeries and uh, um, uh, nurseries, uh, but also uh, places and spaces, whether that is cafes and coffee shops, uh, at places where people can be physically active and where they can meet and, and socialise. And that's why we've made one of our four priorities um, uh, in our new strategy around connected communities, and it's exactly about how we do that. I think we've heard some great contributions uh, this morning. I think I feel optimistic that business is waking up, uh, not only to uh, coming up with solutions that are going to better meet uh, <coughs> the needs and wants of older consumers, but actually starting to see this as, a, as an opportunity. But I think we've got further to go, um, as the minister um, said, both to nurture and bring to scale some of the great innovations that perhaps um, are still at the early stage, uh, together with some of the big players and how we can also ensure that some of the existing technologies can be better used and adapted um, to um, meet people's uh, uh, needs as they age. So if you would uh, uh, like to join me in thanking our panel, thank you Lance, Sarah and Hugh. <laughs> with Aging Better if you're not already following us on Twitter or signed up for our newsletter and updates to keep in touch with future events and also some of our research and uh, activities. So please do keep in touch with us. Thanks very much.